Hello. My name is uh, Martin Yasho. I work in Pixel Federation, and I'm going to tell you why we decided to get into virtual reality development. So, and some early lessons learned. So, uh, from the design and from the business perspective, why we decided to make a game called Colab. It's virtual reality escape room game. You are locked in a labyrinth of puzzles, and, it, and in every room you have to solve a puzzle to get through and get out. So from the design perspective, VR is something every one of us wanted since childhood, even if we didn't know then. We always wanted to be in the game. We wanted to be in the game world. We wanted it to feel as real as possible. And then, then it came and it hit us. And it, it, it hit us hard. And it hit us so hard that some of us forget to close our mouths. And in fact, so many of us forget to close our mouths that it's a phenomenon called Oculus face. Because, you know, there are so many things, so many interesting things you can do in VR. It's, you can visit space, you can be in the game, in the sports even, event you like. You can visit the house you, that is never built, that is not yet built, and of course, you can play games. That's why we are here. And uh, you can do this. Uh, so there comes a question. Can it happen that someone could, couldn't be able to tell the difference between the virtual world and the real world? There have been some documentaries about this. Maybe you have seen them. And uh, yes, it can happen. It happened to our colleague. He was a good guy, but <laughs> then, then he played a game that was so good that he lost interest in the real world. So that's why we decided to make VR games, to make a game that's even better than this, and to save him. OK, that was not a good joke, but yeah. <laughs> so that's why we, we went into VR development. We wanted to see this expression on our players' faces. That's, and why people have this expression? It's called the presence, the feeling of presence, the feeling of being there, the feeling of being in the game, in the experience. You, you believe that it is real. You forget about your surroundings, you forget about your worries, about anything around you. And also this is a transition from watching to experiencing. And as I said before, it's what players want, it's what the whole industry wants, whole entertainment industry wants. That's, that's why there are so many people that dress like their game characters and go and meet because they want to believe that the, the world is real, that it's not just a story, that it's real. And also that, that's why there are s such a big, such a big uh, c cinemas and stuff. And that's taken to the next level thanks to virtual reality because you are cut from the real world and everywhere where you look, everything what you hear and soon everything what you will touch is, is the game, is the game world, the story world. So this is the most important thing about the VR. It's, it's something you can almost never have somewhere in, in different medium. So you may feel like you are there, but the question is if there is a market for the games, if you can make a living. So there have been some predictions. There should be a few million headsets these years, and also the VR market will be 30 billion in 2020, according to DigiCapital, and uh, the wall gaming market now is 64 billion, I think. So it's gonna be big. 
Also, the headsets, they, are, they were all planned to be released in the first half of this year or earlier. The only one delayed is PlayStation VR, which will be uh, released in third quarter, but everything else is out and you can use it on everyday basis. And that's, that's, that's a new platform that's emerging. And with every new platform, there's, when you discover something new, either new platform or new continent and stuff, there is a gold rush. And that's the same as in Facebook uh, with Zynga and stuff. And also there comes an opportunity to be first, to achieve the eternal glory, to be the one who ma to be the first one who makes Tetris for VR. Okay, not maybe Tetri not Tetris because somebody made it, or you can make a Flappy Bird for VR. I don't know. Okay, not Flappy Bird, but you can come with a unique idea that will define the years to come. Yeah. So back to eternal glory. That you may you may ask why. Why we, as a gaming company that's mostly making social games, went into VR? We we saw the opportunity. We uh, we wanted to be the first, to be the ones who will try to define the 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 experience experiences for VR. We wanted to explore the new territory and find out what works. So we said, let's do it. And uh, the first thing was that it was a huge foreign land. We didn't know what to expect, what is there, but there's a good thing about it. Nobody knows. There is nobody with 20 years of VR experience, games development, Okay, there are a few people working in Disneyland and stuff, but there's, there's an opportunity to be amongst the best in the world. So we did some research and uh, what we found out was that it's pretty, there's some pretty simple engine integration with Unreal and with Unity as well. You can even develop VR in VR. There's some kind of VRception. And um, from the programming and graphic side, it's mostly common with the classic 3D games. Also, you have to optimize some uh, stuff because you are drawing two screens at once. And uh, also, the sound is pretty important because it's, it's blocking you from the outside world. It's, if it's uh, positional, that means it's really around you. You can really feel if something is playing from here or some sound is playing from here. You can really, if you close your eyes, you can feel it. And, and you can feel it to an extent when, for example, I was playing a lightsaber game and you, uh, I bet you have seen Star Wars and Anakin in the training or was it Luke? I'm sorry, with the, with the drone coming around and he was shooting at him and he got that mask and blocked side and he was just blocking the bullets with the eyes closed and you can do this. The sound is so precise that you can really hear where they are shooting from and you can block the bullets from the side. So it's pretty impressive and it's pretty important to have a high quality sound. So. Yeah, and the game design. Game design is the biggest challenge in virtual reality because when the player is blocked from the world, he believes he is there and it, there, that's a huge responsibility for you as a designer because you can either cause uh, sickness, people can get really sick, they can feel bad stomach and stuff, that's called motion sickness. That's phenomenon pretty common with, uh, with what people experience in VR, but as a result of bad design in these days. Technology is so good that if you make the, if you design the experience well, people won't feel sick. So that's pretty important. So from the game design side, I did a lot of research. I tried to read everything that's out, that's out there 
I played as much as games as I could, and I spent over a month full time with research. It, and it's really worth it because it pays out later in development when you don't make mistakes that you can uh, that you can find in different games you play, and you won't do the same mistakes again. So for the reading, I, uh, Google best practices guides, uh, Google experiences from VR developers, I even read academic white papers. But what is important, you, you should do at least what works. Because that's, that's really important, as I will talk about it later, about designing around constraints. And this will help you a lot. Yeah, also, also play all games you can find, especially the good ones, because you can write down what works, and you have patterns which you can use in your games. Also, write down what doesn't work. As I said, you don't have to make the same mistakes again. And uh, the first basic findings of VR was that, of course, the motion sickness is evil, and that's what everybody is talking about, but you can you can design the game in a way that people don't get sick. And that's, imp that's important to remember when you are showing virtual reality to someone that he tells you, OK, but I can get sick. No, no, you can't, because we designed it well. And, because, and this, this is a little bit poisoning the well, because there are a lot of designers which are not experienced in VR. They make a game, people get sick, and they think that in every VR game, they will get sick. And that's, that's pretty bad for the industry. But you can, you, can, uh, you can avoid this motion sickness with a good design. Also, the presence is the king in VR. It's the most important thing. It's the same as with Facebook. The most important thing is that you have your friends at hand. In mobile, the most important thing as a platform is that the, the people playing the game have the mobile every day in their pocket. They can take it out, they can play for a few minutes, and you need to count with that in design. And that's the same for VR with presence. That's the most important thing, and you need to aim your design at a goal to create the presence. It's even more important than gameplay. When you have a feature that would I don't know, make people sick or that, it, that will uh, shatter the presence, you should remove it, e even if the gameplay is better. The presence is more, more important than gameplay. And also, with so many z decisions, you can be sure up front, you have to prototype. You have to prototype fast, you have to try more, or you have to be more creative with the information you have. And that's where comes the comes the list of things that work and don't work in handy. Also, how, how does the, how, the, how did I got an idea for a game? Actually, it was not like you hear in a lot of startups that you just suddenly got an idea and it's great. It was during the months of research, I got hundreds of ideas. I've written about 100 of them down and half of them were pretty bad when I looked at at them uh, again, and about 10 of them uh, passed the guidelines and the best practices filter, the lists I made, and you can see here, about 50 of the ideas were okay. But if I choose one of them and I, I didn't have the list, I could then later find out with development after months of development that it wouldn't work because of something. But if you make a list, and you can make a filter, then in the beginning, you can filter the, the ideas through it, and you won't need to make the mistakes yourself. So I worked some more on four ideas that I thought could be prototyped and finished the fastest. And we choose one prototype, which also uh, had a good value in terms of research in trying uh, broad field in VR. And this is it, designing around constraints. That's what I was talking about, the making a list of best practices for achieving presence, bad practices which induce
motion sickness and uh, which types of interactions are interesting in VR. These are the basic building blocks upon which you can build instead of you having to try to prototype everything, try it out, implement it, test it. You can, you can have a list like this and you can go straight to the fun. And also we decided we want to make the game for Gear VR, which is basically a mobile in a, in a socket. But the, but the point is that you have only, the only controls you have is looking around and one button. So there's another type of constraint where you need to design interesting game mechanics that fit just looking around and having one button. So, for example, the, some design decisions uh, when you design around constraints in VR. I chose sci-fi as a theme because there's technology. So, for example, you are, there, there are two golden themes in game design, I think, and it's, it's uh, fantasy and uh, sci-fi. Because, for example, imagine that you need to have a floating ball in the air. If you had a realistic game or a medieval game, that would look very strange. But in fantasy, it's magic. No one cares, of course. It's a magical ball. No one cares. In sci-fi, yeah, it's some high-tech anti-gravity ball. And you, can, you don't need to... Uh, you don't need to... You, you have, like, bigger freedom in design. You can you can make broad uh, you can you have broader broader uh, option pool when you are designing the game so that's why you choose technology also humor if you have too serious world and something is out of the world's logic people can see it and they think about it and that's what reminds them that that this is just a virtual world they they they, they lose the presence, they start thinking, okay, this is not real, this is just something made up and it doesn't fit. But if the, if the world doesn't take itself too seriously, then if there's some logical error, no, no one cares. No one cares because it's, okay, that, that's the game world. And they stay, and they stay and believe that the world is real. And for, for example, the helmet. Uh, there have been some studies which state that having a nose in VR reduces your motion sickness and also uh, framing player in a cockpit or in a helmet or something like this also should reduce motion sickness. And also uh, the, the, thing that, the things that break presence are most often things from real world that doesn't align align with the virtual world. For example, I'm in virtual reality and I walk here and I don't see the table, I, I bump, I'm sorry, I bump into it and it reminds me, okay, this is not real. And I go out of the, uh, and, and it breaks presence and I'm reminded, okay, this is just a virtual world. And you want to, you want people to believe that the virtual world is real as long as you can. And the helmet? In the, in the reality, what do you have? You have a helmet on your face. So you feel the weight of the helmet, you feel the straps on. In, when, you are, when you have a helmet in, in reality, the, your vision is obscured, and that's what we did. We put the helmet in the game, so the weight you feel in reality aligns with, the feeling, with, the, with what you see in the game. And uh, there was some interesting fact that at first, the, the helmet was a lot, lot further away from the side, like from the center of the view, so it ob obscured your view just a little. And then we tried moving the helmet more towards the center. So you see less of the game, which, is, which looks like something that would be bad for players. But then we realized that as in reality, you feel the weight, and in virtual reality, it's blocking your side, these two feelings align, and the helmet and the whole game feels more real. So this was a pretty interesting fact. 
also the rooms in the game. We had to make a fast prototype. We had 15 days with three people who were just learning Unreal Engine, and we had to make a prototype upon which ne we needed to decide if we will continue the development or not. So that's why there are rooms which are the same in the game. But what you need to do is focus on the puzzles. And that's it. Every room is, every room is the same, basically. But no one cares because the game is uh, about the puzzles. Also, the different, uh, the different reason, uh, the next reason for the rooms is the size. Because the VR headsets has limited resolution. It's uh, like n so one, 2004, 2400 by 1600 which is pretty good re resolution, but if it covers your whole world, the resolution, the resolution is really small. So the things in the distance have pretty low pixel density. So that's why there are rooms which are not so big, because there is nothing that is far, so everything looks sharp. And also the problem with VR, the big, the big problem VR is trying to solve, uh, or, or the VR developers are trying to solve, is movement. You have different concepts, but what I think the best is to have a gameplay where you don't, don't move so much. You just, in our game, you come to a room, you have a puzzle, you are solving it, you are looking around. When you solve it, you can go to the next room, and just at that point you are teleporting, you teleport to the next room and you are solving puzzle there. And there's not much movement uh, but this. And it's, I, I think that's the, that's the best solution. And also the puzzles. For example, if there's, if there's so much things you need to, you need to prototype, uh, with the, on the technology side, on the VR side, on the present, on the presence side, and you have so uh, little time for the prototype, you try the puzzles that you know are working, but could be more interesting in VR. What, what is interesting in VR? For example, ha having to look around and remember the space and, and solve puzzles in space. That's something you don't have on your, on your monitor on, or on your mobile. That's, that's something you didn't do bef bec before because the game is before you. But in VR, when, when you feel like you are there, you, are look you want to look around and it's pretty interesting to look around. So for example, lasers. It's well-established mechanics, lasers and mirrors. There are many games with that and you know it works. And when I aligned this like list of puzzles that already works, and I compared it with the list of what works in VR, it was pretty obvious. Let's do lasers, because you need to solve the puzzle in the, in the space around you, it's pretty interesting, and you don't need to prototype the puzzle because you know it will work. And it's pretty, pretty important when you have a little time for development. And also what we learned was that you need to have technical game designers. That means that uh, there are many types of game designers in the game industry. You may work uh, in a way that game designers design a feature, then programmers implement it and, uh, and stuff. But with technical game designers, you need to have programmers create the game logic only and let as much as work possible on the game designers. They should, they should create the levels, they should, they should create the, the puzzles and stuff, they should be able to tweak attributes. Uh, you, you want to move as much work as possible to game designers because that enables you to iterate faster. Because if there is something in VR that you need to tweak, game designers can do, can do it themselves. They don't need to design it, take it to programmers, they implement it, then the game designer sees, okay, 
tweak it by 20% and he brings it back and he finds out that it's too much and stuff, we want to have as much work as possible on uh, game designers. And that's where Unreal Engine comes pretty handy because it has so-called system of blueprints and that's visual scripting. That means just drawing lines and creating games logic with that. So even people who don't know how to program can create a game from this. And these blueprints are deeply embedded in the game engine, so we can do a lot of stuff with them. For example, the game we created, uh, the demo we created for GDC, it was all created in blueprints. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, and these blueprints enable game designers and graphic designers stuff that would otherwise need to be programmed. Also, Unreal is really user friendly and from the engine we used for VR, we really recommend this. So, our first prototype, Colab, uh, we, we did it in Unreal, we did it with three people in about 15 days. And uh, the reason why we were uh, able to do this is, in my opinion, that we didn't need to prototype so much that we designed around the constraints and also we had highly motivated team because we were working with uh, state-of-the-art technology and there's some magical feeling about this so people really like it. So we took this and we showed it on a game developer session in Prague and people really like it. It was like, you showed them your game and they were like, Wow, and then he said, we made this, and they're like, wow, that's great. And that's the, that's the magic when you are working with, with a new technology, you feel, it's hard to describe the feeling, but it's, it feels like magic. And a lot of people say that, okay, but, but it's just because it's a new technology. That's not about the game you created. No, it is. You created a game, you showed it to people, and they come, they, they go away happy. And that's, that's what is game development about. So I think it's pretty, pretty nice to work with VR technology. Also, as I said, team is motivated. It has positive HR effect and P PR effects. So it really pays out as a game studio. And um, yeah, after, after people really liked the prototype, we decided to f do a full VR game called Colab. It's, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's a VR escape room. Uh, now we have about, we have made a 10 minute demo for the GDC and uh, we are working on the new levels. We want to release the game in, uh, in uh, fall this year. And uh, I'm sorry, I need to take a. Okay. Yeah, so um, what was I talking about in the beginning? You have the opportunity to get into the best amongst the world because if you try hard now, if you do the research, you can keep up with the best. And that's what really happened. When we, we went to GDC, which is like the biggest game developers conference in the world. We demoed our game and uh, the feedback was really positive. I, 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 I hope that we are among the best, but yeah, people really, really gave us very good feedback like New York Times featured us about the highlights of GDC and that's, that's something magical that you can, that you can with uh, such a small team achieve only in new technologies like virtual reality and augmented reality and that's, that's really motivating and it's really, really perfect thing to do. So what next? We made a we made a game that's interesting, that's, that's presence inducing. And the next step is social presence. Presence means that 
you are there. You believe the game world is real and the, that you are in the experience. You physically think that you are there. With social presence, that means that you feel that somebody else is there. You no longer play with their avatar. You feel like you're standing next to the person, no matter how far he is. And that's, that's something that will drive VR. It's as, as presence is transition from uh, playing to experiencing, social presence is basically transition from playing with friends to being there with friends. And multiplier is far more interesting in VR. That's why we, that's why the long-term goal is to explore this and try to create multiplier game like the, like the, recreate the experience you have in real life escape rooms. You go there with your friends and you try to escape by solving puzzles together. So, what did we learn? That it's here, that really the virtual reality is here. The foundational technology, the technology that enables you to feel the presence, to feel that you are there, it's al already here. There's no technology breakthrough needed. You, you can go and try it and it's like unlocking your mobile, mobile phone. Yeah, I, I, I've been, as I said, I've been blown away by VR again and again. For example, when we got HTC Vive, it was like first time I could play with the contro controllers for longer and I literally spent the whole weekend like in the work playing and uh, and the problem is that that there's not so much content as in other platforms of course and also as I see it, that designers need to kind of mature into creating or learn to create and build upon the interest in Exper or build interesting experiences in VR, to b build on the strong sides of VR and avoid the pitfalls of VR development. And the question is, do people want VR? Yes. Every single VR device is sold out. There are mul multi-million of videos uh, on the, the the porn industry will be very strong and it will be driving VR like seriously, like every technology. Also, b big YouTubers are catching up, all millions of people watch VR, VR videos. And I, I've personally shown VR to a lot of people and from their reactions, I'm telling you, yes, people want it. The, for example, the headset, headsets. Google Cardboard, it's, it's a simple cardboard device with lenses where you can put your phone in and uh, Coca-Cola made their cardboard, McDonald's made their cardboard. There has been over 7 million shipped cardboards. My guess is that there could be even more. And um, yeah, but it has a lot of downsides. It's low quality. People are not buying a lot of apps in that. But then there's Gear VR. It came free with pre-order of S7. There were about 20 million pre-orders of S6, but uh, Samsung had some difficulties with shipping all of them, so there are not 20 million. But a few months after the, the launch, launch uh, the launched the Gear VR. There have been there have already been over 1 million monthly active users that are active, actively using Gear VR. So there, that's, I think, for an in, indie developer, that's pretty interesting market. Uh, I'm sorry, this is just speculation. I need to come through because I have a little time. So the key points of the talk were, were if you want to make a VR game, do the research, really read, play, and the most important thing is really make a list and use them when you are designing the game. And design around constraints and focus on presence. 
and iterate, fa iterate fast. Lay, lay down the most important questions and be lean and flexible and try to, try to make your game designers learn to make as much work as possible because you will be able to iterate much, much, much faster. So the question is if you choose the red or blue pill. And thank you. Uh -huh. All right, guys, if you have questions, raise your hand. I will pass the mic. Any questions? Yes. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. So could you maybe briefly talk about where's the business opportunity here for the VR? Yeah. So the main business opportunities now lie in the mobile VR where, as I said, Cardboard al already had, oh, if you are talking about business to customer, if you are talking about business to business, it's evident and you would need to find your market there. But from business to customer, like classic games development, it's m m the most interesting is Gear VR and also Google will release a Daydream platform, which will be basically open, open SDK enabling other mobile vendors to make a, a VR device like Gear VR. So I see that these two will be the biggest market markets because of the entry costs. From the PC and console perspective, that my opinion would be that uh, at first Oculus and PSVR will drive the market because there's about 36 million PS4s out there and then you need to invest only 400 or 500 dollars into the VR headset. Opposing the entry cost of PC headset is about, now it's 900 for a computer and 600 for a headset, but um, we've seen a lot of development in the graphic cards, um, in the graphic card industry when they're optimizing the performance of the VR apps and you can buy a VR capable graphic card for I think like 300, I don't know, I don't know exactly, but it's driving the cost of the computers down. So that's why I think PSVR might be pretty big, but we don't know yet. The question is who will make the hardware because the demand is big, but everybody has problems shipping. So that's it. Another but question? Mobile. No. Yes. Hi. Um, I would like to ask that uh, one of your concepts in the game was that uh, you simplify movement or, or you make the game inside. I mean, uh, what's, your, what's your opinion uh, how this will develop in the future? Because I think this is one of the biggest uh, constraints in the virtual reality because you, you, you are not able to move. I mean, come on. Actually, that, that's, in my opinion, is not a big problem because it's, it's like you would say that, okay, mobile has big problems in gaming because you don't have your keys and you don't have your mouse. But in the meantime, people found the gestures that are working and it's the same in VR. You find the things that work when you are constrained with movement. Of course, there will come... Um, there, there are a lot of solutions for movement. Some are better, some are worse. But I prefer designing around the constraint. And that's the point of the constraint. You, you just keep it in mind and you design around that. But in the future, I think that uh, there will be some, some, uh, something stimulating your inner ear. And that's already happening. There, are, there, are tech, there is a technology that's stimulating your inner ear. I don't know how, how well that works, but that might be a solution. Or we go directly to the nervous system. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know yet. But I, I don't see this as a. It's design constraint, not the constraint of the technology. Like it's. It doesn't mean that the technology won't be big, or how do you say? Okay. Yeah, but teleportation is the most obvious solution. So, any questions? 
Hi. Hi. Don't you find it a little scary if if the if the ultimate goal of the virtual reality is to is to create the the presence and also we can also as you said connect to the nervous system and eventually there will be games which uh, yeah. you will be not be able to distinguish from the reality. Yeah. So if you think about this, if, you, if, you, if there, there is also discussion, uh, how how maybe of the ethical side. Um, I didn't think about the ethical side since it's far away now, like far away from our human life perspective. But if you take it in the perspective of the universe and realize, for example, how how old is really the universe and how sh for how short time we are here and uh, how how little time do do we have left into simulating something that is as real as as what we see now we 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 are just a few steps away from creating a simulation that we won't be capable of fully understanding and i think it would be crazy to think that this happened the first time actually actually seriously if if the universe is really as old as it is how small odds are there for this happening the first time i think actually we also lean live in a in some kind of simulation because if you just think about it a little there's like just a slim chance that it's not happening so that's my opinion on the simulation. I actually do have a question which is kind of technical. Uh, if I play game uh, and somebody calls on my phone or rings the bell by the door, uh, it it's very easy because I can pause the game and I can run there or whatever happens. And if I have all this VR thing on me, I have to first kind of put it down and uh, kind of it's a uh, uh, much bigger hassle and uh, the immersion is broken much easier in this way. Uh, do you kind of adapt some kind of core game loop to it? So it's like a shorter or you just say, okay, it's up to the player to just, you know, organize his time. Um, yeah, so we we count with uh, short play times because of the gear we are and because it's kind of. I think it will be some the uh, the audience for the gear we are will be something between mobile and PC core. It won't be as coarse as the PC gamers. So we will aim for 10 to 15 minutes game loops, but. Um, for example, the phone you don't you simply don't answer it when you are in virtual reality. You don't you don't care. So well, if you can <laughs> if you can afford it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> of course. So and um, for example, HTC and uh, I bet Gear VR as well have solutions. No, for example, the HTC you can connect their phone and you can answer your your phone call directly in the virtual reality. And uh, actually, I never tried my real phone with the, like, with the Gear VR. We have only development phones, so it may work with that as well. But I, it's, it's something that you, I, mm, I didn't like, did a design decision that was because of this, uh, these facts that people can disturb you because it's like when designing mobile game, yeah, somebody can call you, but uh, yeah, you need to count with that in the mobile game. But in our single player game, you can pause it anytime. So I didn't think as much about that. So yeah, okay. that's Thank you. Maybe we have uh, time for one more question. Anyone from the audience? Okay, I will ask Martin, is there any, oh, okay. Hello. Uh, have you ever tried or experiment with the web technologies and VR? No, we haven't. <laughs> so maybe one more. <laughs> All right, that's it. Do you want to try? Okay. 
So my question relates mostly that you are progressing still with the... I'm sorry? Sorry. <laughs> you are still progressing with the project you showed us, yeah? Yeah. And my question is, what is some kind of uh, fun and playability and, playabili and playability uh, from the player's point of sight? So it means what challenges are there? For example, you said the puzzles. And you sh shared with us Let's say there is some laser with some yeah. mirrors and so on. Uh, <coughs> so is there something else in, in, in this at least? If you could share with us some ideas, what could be the challenges? What could be the fun out of the game? Uh, like particularly our game, right? Yeah. OK. So um, uh, the main pillars of the game will be the fun puzzles. That's the most important thing, because that will be most of the gameplay. Then it will be the funny uh, commentator or the narrator that's there with you. He'll make some fun of you and stuff. And then we will have uh, some boss battles. So basically, the most effort goes into designing and prototyping and creating the puzzles. And um, currently, I'm very happy that we have found some mechanics that were pretty well that are that are pretty well combined with each other. So we have, for example, yeah, we have the lasers. We have uh, some kind of cubes that you, some kind of cubes that you s need to stack up. You need to come around, and you need to, you need to take into account the space. And for example, you can put a mirror on the cube. So you need to see where are the mirrors on the walls, and then you can combine cubes with mirrors and stuff. And there are several mechanics that pretty well combine with, with each other. So we are in the state where we are designing levels, and we are looking for the most interesting levels. Does it answer your question? Or OK. So we can talk later, or with anyone. I would be happy to connect and talk about VR, if there are any VR developers. All right, guys. Thanks, Thanks Martin. Thank you.